the argument from design. Just brief, briefly, I'm going to go over a little bit of the argument to design. Um, there are several things that have been used as arguments to design. One of them is the cosmos, uh, the Big Bang Theory, and um, the constants that have to be very well fine-tuned. Um, and uh, variants of the anthropic principle don't seem to do it complete justice. And in fact, in, in an effort to avoid that kind of thing, and it's very explicit. It's either many universes or God, so let's go with many universes. Uh, many universes theory has been used as an attempt to blunt it. I think somewhat unsuccessfully, and I think also that they, if you go to infinite universes, you destroy the basis for science. Um, the planet, in our ability to discover the laws of physics and the, the way the universe operates, the sheer fact that, for example, the moon happens to fit very nicely over the sun, give us complete, but just barely, uh, eclipses and allow us to study the uh, solar corona. That may or may not help uh, climate on Earth, but it certainly does help us to understand more about what the sun is like. Um, interestingly, that, does, that argument does not challenge evolution in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't even challenge the origin of life. And yet, uh, Guillermo Gonzalez lost his job over it. Showing that this is not a controversy over evolution, it's a controversy over does God show his tracks in nature. The origin of life, of course. Uh, the Cambrian explosion, which we have just uh, gone over. There are other explosions as well. The evolution of mammals, for example, the evolution of birds. Um, uh, for that matter, the evolution of whales. Uh, and the explanation of consciousness. All are areas in which uh, the argument f to design has been made. Now, the argument from design is usually avoided. And I think the reason why is because we're getting into some very uncomfortable territory for many people. Uh, the argument to design does not require religious presuppositions. Uh, could be a uh, non-divine uh, designer, could be non-supernatural even, and can be done within science. But as soon as you start talking about the argument from design, you get into uh, what's really religious territory. Is naturalism a complete answer? Uh, is materialism a complete answer to what we see? And that's why the argument from design is usually avoided, because now you get into uh, an area where religion happens to be there. And of course, if you use that argument, it is then attacked as religious, which in one sense is kind of ridiculous. Because why should a religious argument be any worse than a, an anti-religious argument? But the way it's usually uh, framed is that it's religion versus science. And science carries with it these close to um, atheistic presuppositions. Atheists know that the argument from design rapidly gets into religion-friendly territory, and that is why they attack the argument to design because they don't want to go there. They really have no problem with the argument to design per se, but they wish to put limits on the argument from design. Um, Francis Crick, for example, and this is um, uh, from a creationist site, uh, and I apologize, it's Wikipedia. Um, <clears throat> in the early 1970s, 
Crick and Argel further speculated about the possibility that production of living systems from molecules may have been a very rare event in the universe, but once it had developed, it could be spread by intelligent life forms using space travel technology, a process they called directed panspermia. This is Francis Crick of uh, uh, DNA fame. And Leslie Orgel, by the way, who is a uh, 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 origin of life researcher. Now, in interestingly, right after that, Wikipedia tries to uh, uh, back off quickly. In a retrospective article, Crick and Orgel noted that they had been overly pessimistic about the chances of abiogenesis on Earth when they had assumed that some kind of self-replicating protein system was the molecular origin of life. So, well, it wasn't quite that bad. Uh, Fred Hoyle, on the other hand, never did repent, as far as we can tell. And this is a quote from Evolution from Space. If one proceeds directly and straightforwardly in this manner, without being deflected by a fear of incurring the wrath of scientific opinion, one arrives at the conclusion that biomaterials with their amazing measure or order must be the outcome of intelligent design. No other possibility I have been able to think of. That's Fred Hoyle. Now, what kind of a designer did Fred Hoyle have in mind? He had in mind a silicon chip. Basically, a computer. Um, how you get computers by random processes is not clear. And of course, that meant that Fred Hoyle uh, got ridiculed because his intelligent designer uh, wouldn't have been created. Of course, then there's also Richard Dawkins, who in a, a moment of candor, which he later repented of, um, mentioned that, uh, yes, intelligent design was, in fact, a, a good explanation, uh, an intriguing explanation, as he put it, uh, for the origin of life on Earth. Of course, he was quick to say that that intelligent designer must have evolved. Why? Well, because if that intelligent designer required another intelligent designer, then pretty quickly you're in trouble. Um, intelligence is something that's sometimes hard to define, but it's something that we all experience. Uh, we know that we can do things that nature left to itself simply won't do. And this room is a good example of it. Houses, um, they just don't happen after an earthquake or a tornado. Uh, the question now is, intel is intelligence the result of a material process? That is, are our minds entirely contained in our brains? Well, there's two answers, yes or no. If the answer is no, then we're already into the supernatural, in which case we have no business ruling the supernatural out. If the answer is yes, the question is, how did that designer get his, her, its intelligence? Well, we got it from an intelligent designer well, where did that intelligent designer get it from? This is one place where who designed the designer is actually a valid question. And the problem is, you can only go back something like 13.7 billion years. I won't argue as to whether it's 12 or 20 or somewhere in between, but at a certain point, you run into a wall. At that point, the original designer cannot have his, hers, or its intelligence based on the arrangement of matter. Because at first there was no matter, and then the matter was so intensely hot that it could not have been organized in that way. And so at that point, you have an intelligence that is outside of the universe. That is just about, by definition, supernatural. No matter which way you go, you run face to face into this supernatural. 
if you accept intelligent design. And that is where these people don't want to go, and that is why they fight it tooth and nail. And that is why they will fight unbelievable stuff, such as uh, very recently Nick Madsky on um, Uncommon Descent was arguing that two-headed coins was consistent with a chance hypothesis. That is to say, if you see 500 heads standing up, it's consistent with a chance hypothesis. I don't know, it seems to me like if you've got a two-headed coin, no matter which head is up, it's gonna be heads. Which side is up, it's gonna be heads, and that kind of removes the chance from it. But, you know, if you don't want to admit that uh, maybe chance hypotheses should be rejected, then, um, Uh, you will say crazy things just because you don't want to give an inch in the argument. Well, now, now we're arguing that design fairly rapidly and, f and fairly persuasively argues for the supernatural. Well, what kind of supernatural? Well, it's smarter than us probably by orders of magnitude, because we are not able to produce life on our own. We have barely gotten to the point where we can produce long strings of DNA that are required for life, but we still require a living cell that has had its DNA removed in order to test those. We don't have, by any stretch, the ability to produce that cell itself. So, that means that it's smarter or more technologically advanced or whatever you want to call it. So we're talking about something that's really, really intelligent. If this intelligent is responsible for creating the universe, which seems like a logical uh, thing to say, then this is an intelligence is also more powerful than us by orders of magnitude. We can influence our, our, our immediate environment, but we can't even make a sun. So you've got something that's very smart and very powerful. It appears that this intelligent is interested in life because it created it. And it's willing to make ingenious designs to keep life going. And finally, this intelligence is probably omnipresent. Now you're going to say, how do we know that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Quantum mechanics says that at bottom, the universe is not made of little billiard balls that bounce off each other according to strict rules. That in fact, particles be become entangled with each other in ways that defy space, time, and interfering noise. You can have two entangled particles and you can put whatever you want to in between them and they're still entangled. You can have entangled particles that go on either side of a galaxy. And that's actually been tested. That means that whatever this thing is, if it's not omnipresent, it's so close to omnipresent as to be indistinguishable. Now, this kind of thing doesn't follow the billiard ball rules. And it's most easily explained by consciousness. But here we have a problem, and that is that different consciousnesses reconstruct the same result. The problem with, uh, with uh, quantum mechanics is that it will tell you that an electron speeding towards a screen is a wave with perhaps a central ring and another ring outside and another ring outside that's fainter. But when it hits the TV screen and makes a flash, it is no longer a wave. It is now, has now suddenly collapsed to a particle. If you see a flash here and you've counted one electron going through, you can guarantee that there will not be another flash over here.
And yet, if you have three, four, 20 people looking at the same screen, they will all see the flash over in this corner. So it's not just that your consciousness collapses it for you, it's that something coordinates it so all the consciousnesses and the video of the screen, by the way, too, show that it went over here. And that raises the question, is, the, is there a final consciousness that coordinates all the other consciousnesses? And if that's the case, then it's easiest to identify that consciousness with the mind that created life, that created the universe, that created a planet that we can live on, that created the varieties of life that show through in the Cambrian explosion and various other um, uh, times in the fossil record where something suddenly happened. Now, where does that leave us? Well, if we take this straightforwardly, the universe is run by a godlike intelligence that is essentially omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Let's just call it God. It certainly fits well with the standard uh, doctrine of the Christian God. Let's assume that that's right. Then if we conclude from that, there is a God, there's a couple of other things that we need to notice along the way, and that is the scientific consensus, what most people call science, cannot be trusted, and cannot be trusted specifically in areas that have to do with theology. They're biased. And that means we're going to have to do our own work, which means we will have to go back to the original data. And on occasion, we may even have to question the original data. I hope not too often. But uh, just recently, there's a guy that uh, got uh, his grant for $19 million taken away from him because he had deliberately put human blood in with rabbit blood, trying to demonstrate that his vaccine for AIDS was working. This came out this week. Nobody knew about it until this week, or very few people. It also means that the project of naturalism, that is trying to shoehorn everything into matter and energy and nothing else, no residual left over, is in fact illegitimate. It can't be done and you can try gently, but if the data won't fit well, you don't have any reason to force it into that. Now, if we want to determine truth, including truth about the past, it then also means that we need to pay at least as much attention to theological propositions as we do to naturalistic limitations. That is, the past is not just about science, it's also about theology. Because predicting what God does is not, God is not limited strictly to natural phenomena. And so in order to understand what God would do, you have to know what what God would do, and not what natural law might suspect you to believe would happen. That changes the whole way you go about judging what might have happened in the past. We should expect that this godlike being might want to be in communication with his creatures. Now, I'm going to use his and realize that uh, that it's probably, I don't like to use its for God. I don't like to use hers because for, for men that implies something that uh, I just assume keep out of the discussion. Um, 
but if you want to say hers, I'm not going to argue with you. What about bad design? That's usually used as a way of claiming that there's no design. Well, then either we don't understand what bad is, for example, the eye. Uh, it turns out that the design for the human eye turns, uh, is a, an extremely good one. There are reasons for having the cones in the back, and there are workarounds that make it to where they work just about as well as if the cones were in the front. And um, with, cones, uh, with cones and rods in the back, it means that when uh, those cells slough off their uh, pigment, it doesn't pile up in front of them. And it also means that they can be right next to very rich blood supply, much richer than what it is on the other side. Um, so calling the human eye bad design <laughs> certainly works well enough. And it looks very, very well designed. Um, or, I think there are some things that are bad, badly designed. But I think that you can argue that either there's degeneration or there, is, there are one or more bad designers. Possibly both. So the malaria parasite is designed. The, the little mechanism by which Plague bacteria pump poison into human cells is designed. No problem. They're bad designers. Now, it does disprove that if you have a theology that says God's in his heaven and all's right with the world, then your theology is incorrect. It means that William Paley, although he started out with a good idea, floundered when he started trying to explain why fleas and lice happened to be there, there to help us to dress better or to stay cleaner or something. No, they're bad design that we have to cope with. But you know, Traditional Christian theology has never had a problem with that. Look at Job, where suddenly an earth, uh, a, a whirlwind came through and tore down the house of Job's kids, killed them all, left one person, just one person, so that he could report what happened. That was bad design. But believe me, it was design. Jesus talks about where did all this, these tears come from? And he said, he didn't say, well, you know, chance happens all the time. He said, no, an enemy did this. So there is such a thing as bad design in Christian theology. It's just um, that there's a bad designer out there. So you might say that if you take intelligent design straightforwardly, you get to good and bad designers, simply by looking at nature. Well, what about all the different religions? Who's right with religion? You know, it's interesting. You see what's happening? The argument is not that there isn't good evidence for a designer. The argument is that it can't be Christianity. That's what's really going on. Well, you know, if you look at Christianity, you'll find that there's a lot more commonality than you usually think about. Early Islam viewed Jews and Christians as people of the book, and they were to be respected. Later Islam had a little more trouble with that, and it's arguable that Islam was started out correct and then started to lose its way as time went on. You can make a good case for Zoroaster being a true prophet. It's very interesting. In Zoroastrianism, the only thing that you can put in where you're going to worship is fire. But if you think about it, it's not that different from the Shekinah. 
And if you think about it, is precisely there because fire does not have a form. It is not an idol, strictly speaking. Now, it's also true that Zoroaster had two beings that fought with each other underneath the top god. And they fought, and they fought, and they're still fighting. And they will continue to fight for a while. As I understand it, and unfortunately I don't know Farsi, so I can't check it in the original. Um, but as I understand it, Zoroaster's original teaching was that eventually the good principle would win. That's the great controversy. Now, of course, later Zoroastrianism kind of said, well, they'll fight forever. And you can say, well, see, Zoroastrianism isn't true. But if you're going to blame Zoroaster for all of the misconceptions of his followers, then by the same token, you have to blame Jesus for all the misconceptions of his followers, and I don't think we want to go there. I have even seen a take on the, on the Tao, or the Tao, as it's more properly pronounced as I understand it, by C.S. Lewis that suggests that this is a leftover eternal morality. That there is, in fact, only one common morality Bits of it have been lost, bits of it have been truncated. But you're talking about a morality that covers everybody. And you have to keep in mind that Jesus himself implied something similar to that when he said, other sheep have either, are not of this fold. There are my sheep already, even though they're not in the fold. Think about it. It's important to remember that proper theology does not get us into heaven. According to James, the devils believe and tremble. They believe that there's only one God. Good for them. And improper theology does not keep one out of heaven. John the Baptist didn't understand exactly why Jesus wasn't tearing up the Romans and forming an army and all that stuff. And he was in prison, and what was Jesus doing? Well, nothing. And Jesus had to correct his theology. But he, uh, at the same time, said there's none uh, greater than John the Baptist. And the point of it is that we're not judged on our theology. If I had to make some kind of principle, I would say that love is the central point of theology. And if you lose that, having other parts correct doesn't matter too much. And if you have that, having other parts incorrect doesn't matter too much. I, I think it's important for us to realize that heaven is not gained by secret code. It is not even gained by the name Jesus. If you maintain that, what do you do with the people who died before Jesus came? Or more precisely, what do you do with a publican who prayed, God be merciful to me, a sinner, never mentioned Jesus, never even mentioned the coming Messiah, and yet Jesus said that this man went to his house justified. That's the same word that everybody argues over. Does it mean made righteous? Does it mean legal standing and all that stuff. Whatever it is, it's good. Now, once you accept intelligent design, you see it all over. You see it in the privileged planet. You see it in the origin of life. You see it in the Cambrian explosion. You see it in other explosions. You see it in evolution in general. You see it in the origin of consciousness. You see it in the origin of mankind, which may have been the same thing. Okay, the only other really scientifically interesting question is, how long did it take? 
And the reason I say that is because there are a lot of models that try to explain how God would implement the design. Did he do it immediately? That's, by the way, old earth creationism, which is a variant of long age God directed evolution. Did he do it in the quantum spaces where nobody can actually detect except to see that the results are not random? That's Kenneth Miller, who's actually in trouble if the atheists ever figure out what he's doing. Um, did he do it by you know, coming down and creating stuff and then letting it evolve and then creating more stuff and letting it evolve? All of them predict roughly the same scientific evidence. They predict an old age for life on Earth. Now, some people will look at an old age for life on Earth and say, that can't be God. It must have been the devil. Probably the most prominent person that I can think of right now that used to, he's now deceased, uh, used to argue this way was Jack Provencia. It's a possibility. The other one is short age and ad flood geology. So the question is, how do you evaluate them once you accept intelligent design? Well. There are three ways you can do it. Number one is biblical, number two is theological, and number three is scientific. And you're gonna say, why aren't we starting with scientific? Because, remember, if you're gonna predict what happened in the past and it happens to do with God, you are far better ahead asking questions about theology then you are asking questions about science. So the biblical issues, well, the nearly unanimous Christian opinion was that it was six days and a relatively short time. And Origen and Augustine are the only people who disagreed with that until we got to where science was kind of forcing the issue which suggests if you take the Bible as it reads, it argues for short age. Now the interesting thing is Augustine in particular, because I've read enough of him to be able to say for absolute sure, Origen is kind of, he's out there and most people recognize that. Uh, but even Origen didn't argue for long ages. They argued for an instantaneous creation. And Augustine believed that it was about 7,500 years ago because that's what the Septuagint numbers added up to. And he believed the Septuagint more than he trusted the Masoretic text. <coughs> now, you can do with uh, what you want to in terms of which numbers you take, but certainly 7,500 years is not anywhere near 600 million, let alone 3 billion. Okay, so the, the interesting thing is Augustine's argument for this very briefly boiled down to three. Number one is he took an, a, text, a text in Ecclesiasticus. That's not Ecclesiastes. That is an apocryphal book. And it said he made all things together. The Greek is koine. And the translation that was used by the King James is probably one of the better ones, which is to say he made all things in general. Okay, in the translation that Augustine had, which is not a good translation, it said simul, which of course is where we get our word simultaneous, and it has the same meaning. So he was using a bad translation of an apocryphal text. I don't think most of us would consider that a good biblical argument. 
Secondly, he argued that God can't or won't, whichever you want to put it, make anything imperfect. That is, God's deal, God is perfect. Everything he makes is perfect. There is nothing wrong with it. And so when you have the plants the third day, but you don't have the animals, that's imperfect. God wouldn't do that. So he did it all at once, and then he just told us this story. More of a platonic theological argument. That's exactly right. It is a platonic theological argument. Philosophic, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, Augustine was heavily influenced by Neoplatonism. It's interesting that we are sometimes influenced by um, theology, philosophy that, that comes from outside the Bible. And perhaps it will do the same thing. And this third argument is a scientific one. He says, he believed in a round earth, by the way, very clearly. Uh, but you see, the sun goes around the earth, so that's easy. But why in the world would God make light go around the world for three days before the sun hits it? So it's easier to just say it all happened instantaneously. Now, of course, that argument won't fly with us today because you don't have to have light go around the earth. All you have to have is unidirectional light and the earth turns. But see, for Augustine, the earth didn't turn. Well. The interesting thing is that Augustine was wrong. Regardless of whose side you're on, nobody now believes in an instantaneous creation. So Augustine felt driven by bad exegesis of an un unauthoritative text, by, uh, I would say, bad philosophy. You know, it's interesting what, what uh, Genesis says, it says, and God saw that it was good, Tov. And God saw that it was good, Tov. And God saw that it was good, Tov. And then when he gets done, he says, and God saw that it was very good, Tov Meod, very good. So the Genesis account recognizes right away that God can produce imperfect things and then work on them later. So that philosophy won't hold. And of course, nowadays the scientific argument has been, has disappeared as we understand more about how the universe functions. Now, about theological issues, well, there are some of them. One of them is death before sin. Does that death include the death of animals? If it does, then you have a problem. Okay, maybe it's not before the devil's sin, but um, so that's a point against God-directed evolution. It's not necessarily a point against devil-directed evolution, but we're going to see that there's some problems there too. One of the other problems of God-directed evolution is that God's method of creation is one in which the strong eat the weak. The people who survive, the animals who survive, uh, survive because they're uh, more Machiavellian than, than the other ones are. Which means that that's all been bred into us. Why would God have that as his method of creation and then suddenly tell us, you can't do that anymore. Now you've got to love each other. Now you've got to have more concern for the other person and treat them as if they belong there. Now, <clears throat> devil-directed creation escapes both of those problems, but it has another problem that's a major one, and that is why do, our, do God's methods look so much like the devil's? That is to say, we have ginkgo trees that are preserved as fossils. And they look just like the ginkgo trees we have in China today. We have calicants that originally evolved and presumably are devil creations by, by a, a devil-directed uh, evolution. 
And now we have Kilicats today. Did God recreate them? Or is some of creation left over? Um, it gets really sticky when you start talking about proto-humans. Maybe some people today are descended from devil created. Must be the blacks. I mean, um, I really don't think we want to go there, you know? And finally, there is one advantage that short age creationism has theologically over either devil creation with long age or God's creation over long age. And that is, what do you do about natural evil? That's the things like, you know, earthquakes, floods, tornadoes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions. Well, think about it. If the world was originally made perfect, or at least very good, you didn't have plates and plate tectonics. That means that you're not going to see volcanoes. That means that volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis are not the product of God's creation. They're the product of the flood, which is explicitly said to be the product of human sin. Okay. Number two, if you had an original atmosphere that didn't have rain that watered it by either streams or by, uh, uh, or by mist, whichever you want to translate that in Genesis, then what it means is that natural, the floods and droughts and tornadoes and hurricanes were not in the original creation either. They came about, I don't know whether they came before the flood or after the flood, but whichever they came, they came about as the result of human sin. So what it does is it means that natural evil can be blamed on human sin and that, that we have no particular reason to have to say that that uh, somebody dying from a hurricane is not the result of sin, any more than we have to say that somebody dying of lung cancer because they smoked is not the result of sin. It's not their own sin, but then we've, already, we've always known that sin spills over onto the innocent. People shoot other people, and before we had guns, people knifed other people, used swords, whatever. So, finally we come to the scientific issues. Now here there's some preliminary things that should be said. Number one, remember that materialistic science can't be completely trusted, certainly not the conclusions. The data may be, and I think that we need to be careful not to throw out data unless we have a good reason for it, but certainly the implications that are drawn commonly are not necessarily the only ones that should be drawn. I think we do have to go back to the original data. And that means we're going to have to be really careful about what we accept as science and what we don't. And sometimes, as in the case of the, uh, the AIDS research, we may have to even go back and reproduce them. Uh, and I think that many times, age is built into the results that are done. Can I say always? No. But I think that uh, it's certainly worth looking at very carefully. And you have to remember that there are some things that used to be really strong arguments for long age, such as the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, which I don't think are as nearly as good arguments for long age as was previously thought. And I think that's probably true as well about the ice cores, although it may not be quite as obvious. That, that ice core data don't point in the direction of long age nearly as much as people thought at one point. 
And you have to keep in mind that the mechanism of evolution has been falling apart as we've been studying it more carefully. So you have to be careful about the, the mechanism of evolution. You just jumped on the ice core for a moment. Can you tell us what developments there have been to question some of the ice core data? Well, we actually have had a couple of presentations on the ice core here. And if you go back to our, uh, our old videos, uh, um, uh, In a nutshell, in a nutshell uh, the layers get kind of vague after you get down about 2,000 years or so. And uh, what you call yearly becomes a matter of opinion. And the ice cores in the, in the Antarctic are all estimated. And of course, they're estimated based on uniformitarianism, which, if there's been a flood recently, can't be true. So the Antarctic stuff uh, is not particularly helpful. And the, um, and the Greenland stuff, uh, there's now some evidence that Greenland at one time had a much smaller area of ice on it. And uh, if that's the case, then the inside may have been putting on more than one layer a year. Um, I mean, that's, that's a whole different subject, and eventually um, we'll try to come back to that. Uh, right now I'm trying to sh do the overview rather than diving into any one particular area. You know, we could go on for three hours on uh, carbon-14 and not finish it. Um, um, but there are, are, are some good arguments from, uh, from science that argue that maybe it hasn't been that long. Let's start out with erosion rates. Continents should have been eroded a lot farther. Well, you know, you could say, well, maybe they're too slow or too fast. Well, the problem with too fast uh, is that if you're a uniformitarian, you can't do too fast. On the other hand, if you're a flood geologist, it's in all probability that our, that our erosion rates now are a fraction of what they were during the flood. Um, and if you couple of them with up uplift, you get some very interesting arguments. Uh, if the erosion has been constant on Mount Everest, 70 miles should have been taken off of it. You can do that. The math is very straightforward. OK, maybe it's 50 miles instead of 70 miles. But you know, we're talking about a huge amount of material. There is still Paleozoic material on top of Mount Everest. How do you erode? Uh, you know, you can't just keep shoving stuff up without eroding the top off. How do you keep that Paleozoic material there after 50 miles of erosion? There are paraconformities and soft sediment deformation. Paraconformities themselves are bad enough, where two layers lie totally flat, and how do you get a flat layer? When you see interfingering of those two layers, suggesting that the bottom layer was still soft when the top layer was laid down, now how do you explain that it wasn't eroded off in 6 million or 10 million or 20 million or however many million years? There are paleocurrents, which don't speak to the, to the time frame, but they do speak to the idea of an entire worldwide deposition layer, or certainly continent-wide. Uh, there is, of course, carbon-14 dating, where you find carbon-14 in very, very old material that it should have been decayed from, you know, millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago in some cases. There are preserved ancient tissues blood, bone, osteocytes still there in, dino in dinosaur bone. Um, there, are, there are preserved ancient bacteria. 250 million years old can still grow. Yeah, there's spore forming, and yeah, spores are tough, but 250 million years? In the middle of potas uh, potassium, sodium, whatever, you know, which has a certain amount of uh, radioactivity in it, and you'd think it would have uh, radiated them and killed them by, by this time. Um, I, will, I should have put that genetic entropy argues that 
things can't be that old as well, um, that they would have died by now if they were hundreds of millions of years old. I think that it is helpful to be in a denomination that has championed short age. That's one reason I think that um, I, I feel good about being an Adventist given this data. I think that it's even possible that the Seventh-day Sabbath with, a, with its memorial of creation could be a symbol in the future for believing in a short age for life on Earth. Um, one uh, argument that's sometimes used against Christianity is what kind of a God would torture people forever for temporal sins? Well, my reply is it is very helpful to be in a denomination that emphasizes the second coming as when rewards are handed out rather than at death and that says that the wicked after they've served their purpose are allowed to sleep. Probably prefer to sleep and God allows it. What about the idea that all ID advocates are creationists and therefore because they're being funded by Christian reconstructionists or their fellow travelers, maybe their fellow travelers too. You see, we just want Christianity to take over the United States and maybe the world as well. Well, I don't think it's true now. I think if you talk to Bill Dembski or Steve Meyer, <laughs> you don't find them as Chris, Christian <laughs> reconstructionists. Um, I suppose that you could say that they're um, fellow travelers, but you know, if you're going to do that kind of stuff uh, on the basis of very flimsy evidence, I, I, you know, I mean, there are people who, who argue this way, um, Barbara Forrest and Paul Gross in particular. Um, but it's just not true. Now, it could become true in the future. I think it could become true partly as a reaction to people who are advocating evolution uh, or atheists who are being unscrupulous in their, in their arguments and unscrupulous in their behavior towards people in academia. That they could, that they could want to say, well, you know, we'll allow all kinds of Christianity, but we're certainly not going to allow atheism. And it could get very sticky. I think that Expelled could bring about an opposite reaction when a change takes place. I'm frankly very concerned about things like uh, the um, filibuster disappearing in the Senate because I think that what very easily could happen is there's a change in the Senate and all of a sudden the people who did that will be very sorry that they did what they did. And I do think that it is helpful to belong to a denomination that believes strongly in religious liberty, not just for itself, but for other people who have opposing viewpoints. And I think that our denomination in particular should never let go of religious liberty for that precise reason. But that's my opinion. Now it is time for you to express yours. You may be. You may have been speaking euphemistically, but the second death is not the death of sleep. The second death is thrown into hellfire. It's done. I mean, it's permanent extermination. You know, there's there's nothing to wake up to. I mean, it's the first death is the death of sleep. Just to be clear, for anyone who might hear that and not understand. Well, if you've made your final decision that heaven is not the place you want to be for eternity because it doesn't allow you to do what you want to do, there may come a point where you prefer death to life. And if that point happens, I think God will honor that choice. It's painful. I mean, how is it different than the death of Christ? Uh, I mean, not in terms of crucifixion, but in terms of agonizing and seeing what you could have had, what was available, and knowing you'd never be happy there anyway, but sorry that you did what you did, and not sorry enough to change, but I'm just saying that the second death 
is not sleep, and the first death is to be clear. Well, I, I think there's a difference in, in one sense between the first and the second death, and that is that all, all people will be resurrected from the first death. Uh, the second death is, um, for most people, final. There are those who argue, and I ha tend to agree with them, that, that Jesus experienced the second death, in which case it isn't even permanent then. Because it wasn't permanent for him. A unique situation, yeah. Very uh, interesting and comprehensive um, review here. I would come back to uh, the beginning <clears throat> where it seems to me it's uh, probably one of the more uh, difficult arguments is uh, for the non-believer is that or for those who accept to design, once you accept to design, uh, how can you ignore from design? Uh, it seems to me that's a very weak uh, barrier that is erected there, and that uh, uh, those who advocate to design but won't go beyond it. Uh, I don't think they have a very sound foundation to stand on. Uh, in, in, um, as they proceed and insist that uh, uh, that's where we stand and we're not going to go any further. Well, here's, here's the thing. If you talk to Steve Meyer privately, he'll tell you that uh, he personally puts it together as a Christian. That in him, in, to his mind, the intelligent God, uh, the intelligent designer is, in fact, the Christian God. He simply doesn't want to say that out loud because if he does, then people will say, well, you're just arguing for Christianity and that's all a bunch of bunk and you see, what about, and, and they'll go after anti-Christian theological arguments. And so, he doesn't, he wants to keep the focus on the scientific. And so he doesn't try to go there. Now, in my opinion, you need to go there so, sooner or later. And in fact, my personal tactic is to, is to push them until they say, well, but you don't have any evidence for God. And I'll say, okay, now we know what the real issue is. And you can have your no God, and I'll have my God, and we'll at least understand each other even if we disagree. And people on the outside can see that the real objections to intelligent design are not scientific, they're religious. That in point of fact, this is a science versus religion argument. But we're on the science side. And I think once we say that, that's about as far as we can go. Until somebody is willing to step over that point and say, okay, well, I can accept that there's a creator. I, I, uh, think, we, I think we can recognize uh, the reason scientists feel so confident is that science has been so successful as it has given us uh, data about the material world. Uh, and we, but uh, to stop there is too simplistic for the reality that we all experience. I mean, like consciousness, you talk about consciousness, just one example of it. Uh, you don't find that by looking at matter, no matter how long you look at the matter. It doesn't give you consciousness. Uh, so Even with, if you throw in quantum computing, you probably still don't get to consciousness. Yeah, well... Quantum, uh, it, it takes courage to um, deal with quantum because it doesn't make much sense in a way, but uh, uh, anyway. Yeah. <laughs>
I agree. Appealing to quantum is like appealing to magic. I don't understand quantum theory at all. But anyway. Uh, That's okay. There are physicists who tell you that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you, you don't. don't. All right. <laughs> so uh, you're proposing arguments from design, right? So are you suggesting, I'm not, I'm just playing devil's advocate. I, I think I know what you will say, but are you suggesting that uh, if you argue from design that therefore you have to argue that everything is designed? In a kind of general overall sense, that's probably true. Everything is designed by something. You could argue that um, consciousness is primary. But you can also, uh, people, people make their own, uh, shall we say, quasi-random designs. Well, I mean, couldn't I then argue, counter-argue with you saying that, uh, well, you know, your design hypothesis explains everything and therefore nothing, and you don't really have to research it, you don't have to study it, and you can't be falsified. Well, frankly, I would prefer that to a hypothesis that didn't explain everything, but it's an and that specifically left some things out as unexplainable and perhaps worse well, a single hypothesis to, say, to say that it's against the evidence. Well, a single hypothesis that explains everything excludes any other hypotheses for any other things. Uh, uh, which I have a problem with. Well, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. I think that there are levels of design. What do you mean by that? And the best way I can explain that to you is, let's, uh, supposing you see a picture of a tree that has been grown, that comes up here, and then that comes out, bends backwards, and then bends up, uh, but like about eight or nine uh, different rungs. It looks for all the world like a chair. Now, was the chair designed? Was the tree designed? If you're taking a design perspective, the tree was designed, but the chair was an extra layer of design imposed on the tree. So how would you apply that to something more classic like a snowflake or a, a rock in the riverbed? Um, a snowflake, there are some, um, as I understand it, electromagnetic reasons why snowflakes are six-sided. Um, so is each individual snowflake deliberately carved by an intelligent designer? Uh, it doesn't have to be. What would you say are the odds of that? But what I'm saying is that once you establish a part of the design that the rest of the design fills itself in by known laws. Well, the way it, I'll just I'll present what I think it is, and then you can present what you think it is. I think a snowflake is not design. I think it's uh, the product of uh, random nature and that God does not deliberately carve out every snowflake. However, I do think that natural laws are designed. And so you, you kind of step back a level, if you want to call it that, like it, you were it, saying. The symmetry the of a snowflake is designed. Right. Well, the, the laws that produce whatever, the, random, the randomness or the chaos, if you want, of the snowflake, uh, I think those laws were designed. However, I think they were designed to act randomly and chaotically um, it, within certain restrictions that produce six sides every time. But within that restriction, then there, there's chaos or randomness there that, uh, at least from our perspective, it appears random. So I don't. I think that to say that everything is designed is kind of misleading in a way, um, because if you cannot detect non-design, you really can't detect design. You can't hypothesize it in a way that's rational, and that you can test and falsify. Only if you say that not everything is designed can you actually test the design hypothesis in a rational way. And so I say, for example, there's a difference between a river rock that's clearly, to me, not designed and a and a granite cube that's highly polished and symmetrical. That's clearly designed. Because I can falsify the granite cube hypothesis. As long as I can find something natural that's not intelligent that produces something like a highly symmetrical polished granite cube, then that would falsify that hypothesis. Same for the SETI hypothesis. But it's if you can find something natural that produces a SETI radi radio signal, then you can falsify that, that hypothesis. And therefore, it's a more scientific, more rational hypothesis. And in fact, that happened once. With this, with yeah, the little, little, signal, little green men the in the The LGM pulsar. episode where there was beep, 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 beep on a regular basis and, uh, 
uh, people figured out that that was a quasar. Or right, not a quasar. so you have to be able to falsify the intelligent design hypothesis. If you can't, then I would agree with the people who challenge and say this is a theory that explains everything and therefore nothing. But there are some things that are uh, deliberately left to random. Uh, to ran uh, and, and that's, by the way, biblical. You're arguing that there is no random chance. By I the mean, way, you even quoted well, Christ that said that, uh, that the, you know, an enemy has done this and therefore there's nothing <coughs> random. And in some sense, I agree, from God's perspective, there may be nothing random. But from our perspective, he hasn't designed things that way. From our perspective, things do appear random and unpredictable and chaotic. And, and uh, so it depends on your perspective where you're arguing that, I think. So. It's a fine dance between free will and the sovereignty of God. I mean, how would you explain that God designed free will? I mean, that, that's... I don't think we could possibly understand free will. Only God can understand that. Well, but at the same time, it is, it is probably the most important fact when it comes to humans. I don't think so, because if I can't understand my own freedom of will, I can just depend on God that says that I am free. I can't prove my own freedom. I can't even test it in any possible way. I only depend on God's say so. Uh, so to me, it's irre almost irrelevant uh, outside of that God's playing the game fairly and because he says so. Well, if you, if you doubt your free will, then go someplace, take off your clothes and see how long it is before you get cold. And then you'll decide whether or not you want to put them back on. Well, <laughs> now yeah. I will point out at this point that um, it is now 11:30, and I know some of you need to be elsewhere. So, if that's the okay. case, I, uh, I you've been given notice. But go ahead. One of the things I think we need to pay attention to when we get involved in the intelligent design debates and discussions is that science, by its modern definition, precludes the possibility of the existence of God. Science, by its definition, is specifically the study of things that are measurable and observable. And the minute we start talking about the supernatural, the minute we start talking about an intelligent creator, designer, if we want to put it in those terms, is that we can't, we, we, get, we will get laughed at by the scientific community because it's not something we can measure. Now, that doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that having scientific discussion is often very much strained because it does not seem as a legitimate scientific opinion that you can have because there is no way to test it. Well, that's not true. It's a hypothesis that we have. We cannot well, test whether or not there is a designer. With the testing design hypotheses as long as you don't call it God. That's why there's study. That's why there's anthropology. And not really. Uh, in fact, I'm having some fun right now proposing that there is carbon-14 in material that by standard evolutionary or standard uh, geologic age criteria should not have any. Mm -hmm. And that's testable. And it's being tested and we're finding it. And so to argue that, that science can't, uh, can't point beyond itself, I think, is, is wrong. Uh, the scientists will tell you that, but I think they're biased. They are. But again, the, the modern definition of science goes by what is observable. The problem is, the conclusion, generally speaking, is that anything supernatural is not measurable by the natural, and we are part of the natural world. But it's not true, and that's, well, that's my precise point. You can, the, the problem is it's not directly measurable. It's not directly it's measurable, not directly but there, measurable are, there, are, there are things that you can measure. To directly measurable. There are things that you can measure that are direct. And that uh, carbon-14 in very old material is one of them. Well, lots of things in science right. are not directly measurable. Yeah. Anthropology is based on detecting things that are designed, where you never saw the designer. Same for SETI. Detection of design by finding a, a signal in a radio frequency is not directly detecting the designer. You're just the designer. You're not yeah. physical. Right. Again, you can use methodological naturalism and use direct measurements 
based just on the assumption of methodological naturalism alone, where you don't assume the supernatural or God or anything, and you can detect design scientifically, and every scientist will agree on the planet. Ariel. Um, I, I, would, uh, I would simply like to, to add uh, uh, this comment. It is true that present science tends to exclude uh, the non-materialistic. Uh, this is not the way science was originally conceived, at least modern science. Uh, uh, Newton, Boyle, Pascal, Linné, uh, you go on. All these people incorporated God into their science. Science has redefined itself recently and has expelled God from the explanatory menu. Uh, this is this is all interesting. I, I would say but has attempted to expel, expel God, and I'm not sure they're totally successful. Yeah, but uh, uh, that is pure materialistic science is not as interesting as if you're looking for truth. If you're looking for truth, you are going to expand your thinking beyond the materialistic. And uh, it gets very interesting when you do that. Um, first, I, I would like to uh, compliment you on uh, undertaking an enormous philosophical task. Sort of reminds me of a lecture that was entitled All About Everything. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a question, and that is, um, you have followed the design, uh, design hypothesis and the people that um, advocate it for several months now, and you have used in, in um, they have used, and you seem to have agreed that they are using it fairly, scientific evidence to prove the design hypothesis, or at least to make it highly likely. It's probably yes. as best we can do. You've come now to an interesting point where the road divides. Uh, they have concluded that to continue down the road that they have been on, they basically have to continue the scientific evidence and go down the road of long age. You've taken a sharp turn. I don't know whether it's to the right or the left. <laughs> and you have now said that in your opinion, the scientific evidence is supportive, or at least permits, a short age chronology. Can you Elaborate a little bit on why you separated company with them at that at this point. Um, I think because, uh, well, in in some cases it's simply a matter of waiting. Uh, for example, Henry Morris was originally a, a believer in long ages, and possibly even a, uh, I'd have to look up to be sure, he may have been an atheist at one point, or certainly a, or at least a, you know, kind of a deist with a God starting this whole thing and just not, not messing with anything. Um, as time went on, uh, he eventually came to the point where he believed that there was more evidence for short age than not. Um, I think that there are people in transition, and I think that there are people who who would like to believe more, but can't see how they can put it all together. And I think that uh, probably Philip Johnson, uh, at least when I met him, fell into that category. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason, the reason that I take the turn that I do, or that they take the turn that they do, whichever, you, whichever way you want to phrase it, um, is because what I see is once you have rejected the materialistic, naturalistic rules that some people put on science, you realize that the rules of the game now change. And the theology becomes as important mm -hmm. 
a science for looking at way back when. And I see a God who can intervene because he does. Among other things, he's intervened in my life. And uh, he's intervened in people's lives whom I know. And once you accept that, then you are no longer tied to, well, uh, if there's no naturalistic explanation, I'll just have to forget it. <clears throat> and I think that a major thing that has changed my mind also, besides the origin of life itself, which to me just screams design, the major thing that changed my mind was the starting to look at, well, what do you do? Uh, you know, if you really believe this stuff, you might want to start looking for evidence of things like carbon-14. And I started looking and I started finding it was in the literature all over the place. Just they weren't reporting it that way. <clears throat> and it's pretty clear. And then once, uh, and then, so then you say, well, if that's really true, we should do some experiments. So we did some experiments. And they came out our way. And at a certain point, you start saying, you know, this hypothesis has predictive power. Maybe we should trust it more. Maybe I could just add to what you're saying. I, 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 We've got a, f a mic here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what you did, it seems to me, is that he deconstructed the modern scientific epistemology at the beginning and essentially showed their significant um, metaphysical elements to it and that theology is part of the game, whatever your position is. And then where he takes his turn, I think, is in saying, okay, fine, it's fair to take theology seriously as part of our epistemological framework. Now, as an Adventist, we have certain theological insights and commitments, and um, among those are questions of theodicy. And so as you began to read, once you deconstructed the epistemological approach and began to reconstruct it, you gave theology its due place, I believe, and as part of that due place as an Adventist, someone who takes seriously the character of God, uh, as you rebuild, uh, there become certain choices that are made regarding the physical evidence that need to be consistent with, I think what is our central theme as Adventists is theodicy. There are many Christians, it's interesting that long age creation is probably most articulately put forward by Christians from the branch of reformed Calvinistic outlook for whom theodicy is of no real concern. Because whatever God does is right, it, and it's therefore... It's right, and we don't need to defend it. But as Adventists, we make this particular turn and move because in our theological framework, the character of God has a significant and even central place. And I don't think it, un or I don't think it uh, unfairly distorts the scientific evidence, but it becomes a framework with which you begin looking for different things. And the carbon-14 example you give is a very good example. And I think the Stephen Myers and the Philip Johnsons um, are from part of the evangelical theological world that has not yet taken so seriously uh, uh, these concerns of theodicy that Adventism with its Arminian roots does take very seriously. Um, and I'm hopeful that in ongoing dialogue and conversation they too will see now that, now that it's acceptable t and, and even required to take into account theological considerations that in fact these are legitimate theological considerations to take into account and that you can look at the scientific data fairly and, and, and come to these sorts of conclusions. So I applaud you for that. You said Stephen Meyer is a Christian in private, but doesn't he see the theological implications? Well, of course he does. He says, now, you know, you can believe who you want to as the intelligent designer. For me personally, it's God. And if you catch him when he's not, you know, making pronoun. In fact, he will say that out loud. It's just that he won't put that into his, his book because people will use that as a hook to, oh, he's just a religionist and he's biased and you can't believe anything he says. In private, does he see the implications? Just a minute. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were... Does he see the implications of long age for his Christian theology? 
Like there's some Christians, like mm -hmm. Kenneth Miller you mentioned, who are Christian, but they still uh, recognize long age. And they play, a lot of theistic Christians uh, have no problem with, uh, with long age for life on the planet, evolving, living, dying. Uh, well, uh, in the case of Behe, he's Catholic. Uh, and Catholicism, I think, has uh, made its peace with science in whatever form it happens uh, shortly after they got their nose bloodied over Galileo. I'm and, and then, uh, well, go ahead. I'm not, um, I'm not sure you can do this. At least I'm uncomfortable with it. Because if you're going to follow the scientific method, which you have, to undergird intelligent design, then the only way that I can see that you can make your turn is to, because you're going to go with a preponderance of evidence. That's what you've been doing for the last three months, to, to make the case for intelligent right. design. Now what you're going to do is you're going to say, the preponderance of evidence scientific is against me. I'm going to put in theological evidence to make up the balance. I'm, when I say I, you can't do this, I'm not saying you didn't do it. I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that you can, unless you overtly say, I'm no longer going to follow the scientific method in which I'm going to follow the preponderance of evidence. Now, you can find um, isolated uh, pieces of evidence, such as the carbon-14 or, or the... Um, ice cores or what have you. But, it, I, and I guess I'm asking explicitly, are you going with the scientific method and continuing after you've made your turn by adding to the now what is a very small amount, proportionally of scientific evidence, <laughs> the theological constraints that we all agree on? Is that how you get to make that turn, I guess is my question. Um, I'll let a comment here, and then I'll try to answer as well as I can. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, just to make it more clear, as what Dr. Bull is saying, well, are you willing to abandon uh, what you yourself perceive as the weight of evidence and go with what uh, <coughs> you perceive the Bible is saying on, on certain cases? Um, go ahead, uh, Ariel. Uh, You've been waiting for a long time, and then I'll well, try to answer. It's okay. It's all part of the this, this, same discussion. This seat discussion. is kind of hot right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to keep in mind that uh, the scientific literature is loaded with conclusions that exclude God from its explanatory menu. We need to keep this bias in mind. Uh, it's overwhelming. You perhaps have only one scientist out of a thousand who's willing to try and insert God into the scientific literature. And, and uh, the editors won't let him. Yes, I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we need to keep in mind that, that tremendous bias out there. And, uh, you know, there's a, the geologic, there's a geological saying that uh, you know, I, I never would have seen it if I hadn't believed it. Uh, this, this tremendous materialistic bias in the scientific literature uh, needs to be borne in mind uh, and we need to distinguish clearly between data and interpretations and uh, sometimes it's hard to, to distinguish between those two. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's easy to be overwhelmed by it if you uh, want to go by the majority or if you want to think w really we, we have the final answer in science. But if you suspicious that there may be something other alternative, then uh, no, you, you want to look for those particular uh, features that go beyond the present paradigm and permit us to, to escape uh, its trap. Well, perhaps but, I can... Perhaps well, I just can, to, to reiterate, yeah. for 13 weeks you have followed the scientific method. You have mm -hmm. gone with the weight of evidence and you've built what I consider a, a very a very convincing case for intelligent design. You've done it scientifically. All of your data, I think, has been scientific data. Now it seems to me, having made this turn, you've inserted something new, and I, I understand why, and I even, I'm not sure that I disagree with you, 
I just would like to know how you justify to yourself the fact that you're no longer going with the weight of the scientific evidence. You're going with very small pieces of it. Well, I, I okay, the, the one, there's a couple of things, and one of them is you have to disambiguate something. And that is, what is science? Now, one answer that is given nowadays, it is basically boils down to it's applied naturalism. And that's why methodological naturalism is a good rule for science. Uh, it's not only a good rule, but it is an absolutely mandatory rule. Well, if there is something outside of nature, then people who are laboring under that rule are laboring under a misapprehension. There's no two ways about it. So if you accept intelligent design and then you accept that it points to a supernatural designer, it doesn't even have to have all the attributes of the classical Christian God, but just enough of them to where, you know, it, it can do a lot of really weird things. Scientifically weird things? Uh, yeah, scientifically weird things. You can detect it methodologically. You can detect it methodologically. Which, by the way, um, I'm personally an enemy of the God of the Gaps argument because I don't see how you can detect anything except by the fact that it explains something that nothing else explains. And that's an argument. This chair I'm looking at right now is a chair of the Gaps. It looks like there's a chair there. It doesn't look like there's concrete that goes beyond it. You probably can't see one of my feet because the chair is in the way. I can't see either of them. You're footless, okay. You're footless and fancy free at the moment. Yes. Uh, and, and the point of it is that everything we look at in nature, we deduce that it's there because of positive evidence, it looks like a chair, and negative evidence, you don't see anything through it. Okay, that's just the way it is. And so to say God of the gaps is illegitimate is, a, is, is really a roundabout way of saying there is no God. Well, it's also God of the gaps is everything in science. I mean, you have, to, you have to have the null hypothesis for science itself. You have to have a gap that there's no negative evidence against you, right? Uh, but but, uh, but in, any, in any case, you see, there is, there is another definition of science that is, that is neutral to the existence of God. And that is science is a study of the reproducible. And, you know, that means that if miracles become reproducible, as reports have it that they did 2,000 years ago, that you could reliably go up to this man from Nazareth and, and uh, get yourself healed from blindness, then that becomes, in a certain sense, scientific itself. The science of miracles. I saw the hand twitch. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you've made another turn here, and I'm still going straight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, the thing of it is, that if, if what science has to do with is the reproducible. Empirical evidence is usually evidence, described as. Not just empirical, because history is empirical, but you can't reproduce it. If you want to find out who won the Battle of Waterloo, you read people's accounts of it. You do not go back and refight the battle with French and English. I'm using empirical so as, as a syn synonym with experimental, but... No, well, Go ahead. Uh, you can't experiment on the Battle of Waterloo. Exactly. That's why I don't think it's empirical evidence, but continue. Uh, well, so uh, uh, but... Really, really uh, yes, because I... And I think that actually this is an important point. People who have experienced God are a lot harder to shake in their faith than people who know him only by the theory that they grew up with as a kid. I can give you an illustration of a guy who, a uh, very bright guy from here, went to Mass General. He was that kind of bright, uh, as his, as his, uh, in, during his training. 
Still trade. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, he went to Mass General, okay? He got there. It was a completely different, uh, 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 different uh, milieu. Everybody drank. He didn't drink. Oh, you're from California. Well, you must smoke weed. No, don't smoke weed either. And it's very just, you know, totally, they, could, they didn't know what to make of him. But he didn't have answers to, you know, evolution, the time scale, whatever. He wound up kind of just basically hunkering down in terms of his belief system because he didn't know what to do about it. But, but that experience didn't lose him because he had his own personal experience that he couldn't tell himself it was all a bunch of baloney. What I'm saying is there's a lot of more evidence than just science. So there will come a point where I think you can fairly say mm, the scientific evidence may be weighted somewhat over here, but if I look at it, the experiential evidence may overweigh that. Why don't you call it by the same name? Why do you give it a different name besides science? Um, well, because it's not exactly reproducible for other people. Yeah, yeah but it's reproducible it, it, for yourself. Well, it's reproducible for yourself, yes. But that's a bit more subjective than... But it's a little more subjective. You can't... You can be on an island by yourself. You can't... <laughs> you can be on an island by yourself, entirely by yourself, and do empirical experiments that are reproducible by you. In fact, that's what, you really can't do experiments for somebody else. Everything that you believe is scientific, you believe it because of your own individual perspective and your own individual experiences. Everything is done on the individual yeah. basis. And so why do you make a distinction between some things that you believe based on your individual conclusions that are scientific and other things that you individually experience well, that aren't. Other, other things maybe can't be shared as well. Yeah, there's you can't a, do a single blind, let alone a double blind on yourself. That's right. But I, let me uh, follow up on. I mean, I think you can. I think Dr. Bull's question is an excellent question, and I mean, I, I and I think you have the answer, but I think for some reason you're dancing around it. But let me. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's a, a, it's a very important question in terms of there seems to be a, a tremendous amount of evidence for intelligent design. And, and I think you're pointing out the case has been well made and it's widely accepted. The question about young earth creation, I mean, and, and I'm in the same boat here. Intelligent, intelligent design I have no problem with. I can go into any polite, educated society and make a good defense for intelligent design. But often when I'm in very polite and sophisticated societies, I keep my mouth shut when it comes to young earth creationism because it is largely a faith commitment uh, that runs counter to much of the scientific data that is out there. Precisely. And I, I recognize that. But the, the, the point that you're making, I think, is that scientific, the scientific method is not a neutral method and that there are all sorts of people out there based on certain metaphysical, philosophical, and even theological assumptions that, are, that have all sorts of incentive, including government funding and uh, access to resources, making a tremendous amount of material and data and information that seems to support the long age view. And, but this data itself is not neutral data, and that if we, much as when we come to just the intelligent design question generally, and it's taken a while for certain people with some resources to sit down and say, what, but wait, look, you can look at this evidence in a different kind of way. There's even a smaller group of people that actually believe in a young earth creation, but I think it's Paul's contention, and it would be the position I would hold anyway, uh, that you can use the scientific method fairly and, and, and more neutrally, or, or looking at the information in a way that isn't committed to old age views, and begin to build scientific evidence or data that will, in fact, point in another direction. But you're, as a Christian, you can't be committed to just following the bulk of the scientific data because that data itself is produced by a biased group, community, whatever, uh, that has its own inbuilt theological prejudices. Well, especially you can't, you can't rely on the conclusions that they draw. Right. Uh, the reason that I say that is because I think that if somebody says, well, this particular rock has, you know, 
0.001% argon, 40, that they're probably right. right. Okay, that part isn't, that part isn't, isn't what's so much in question. It's, it's does that combine with how much potassium that's in the rock, does that give a meaningful age to that rock and, and what, does the, what does the age signify? Mm -hmm. That's a whole right. different question. In fact, I would, for me personally, I would go beyond that uh, to say that if I truly believed w with my own in personal investigations that the weight of scientific evidence, the clear overwhelming weight favored a long age for life on the planet, I would have to discard what the Bible says. In fact, I was willing to do that. For me, I do not believe that the weight of evidence favors long age for life on the planet. I think it's clearly in favor of a short age for life on the planet, the weight of evidence for what I've been able to personally tell. Um, and I would have to disagree that I would go with whatever I thought the Bible yeah. says. Now, and the reason I say that is not based on the conclusion. I believe that the conclusions of most scientists is that it's long age. I agree with that. However, I don't believe that the data itself supports that conclusion. Now, here's, here's, the, here's two things that I take into consideration that, that, will allow me to, that will allow me to take a, a, scientific, a scientific viewpoint and still, and still not go there. And, and they are, number one, that, that, that the argument that is being made basically is that there's this great big tiger and I should be afraid of him. And yet, when I test the tail, it turns out to be made of paper. I have tested a spot on the back, it turns out to be made of paper. At a certain point, I think you can start to say maybe the whole thing is a paper tiger. That, for example, there was a time when Yellowstone fossil forests were used as just overwhelming evidence for long age. I mean, how do you explain all those layers? Well, that thing is kind of falling apart. They even took it off of the, uh, off of the sign, as I understand, uh, that sits in front of the Yellowstone Fossil Forest as to, you know, this is, you know, 300 years per layer or whatever it was. See, uh, when I see tendencies that start going that way, I start thinking that our knowledge right now is incomplete and we project as to where we're going to go. So you would disagree then with my assumption that you were going up to today, or up to you made this turn, you were going with the weight of the scientific evidence, and now you are still going with the weight of the scientific evidence. It's but just it's that being re-weighed. You, re you, you, you perceive the, the weight going in a different direction than the than the rest of the intelligent design community. I think that's fair. I hope that a good share of them, and I happen to know that uh, mm -hmm. one of them is in fact a short age creationist, I hope that with time that they will start seeing the wisdom of that and, uh, and possibly coming with me. And, and that's why it's so important. See, for me, carbon-14 is not just an evidence. It's an evidence that I picked out beforehand and then went after, and it's there. Yes, but um, you've, got, you've got a small amount of evidence that, that I'm not arguing with. Uh, what I am arguing with is that there's, an, uh, there's a huge amount of, of carbon-14 evidence uh, based on, for instance, tree rings showing that um, as the tree, as you go uh, closer to the center of the tree, the carbon-14 gets less. Well, and that's expected on either Either exactly, hypothesis. and uh, there are peat bogs, and there are uh, sequences of trees that go back um, and theoretically. And there's Robert Brown's treatment of peat bogs. Yeah, and there's 18,000 years in Irish oaks and all of this. Now, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not expert enough to, to be able to uh, determine exactly, but I have to concede that there's a lot of evidence there, and you've got some um, that goes against it. And I guess my question is, at this point, you, you view your evidence in terms of the scientific method as going with the weight of evidence. It, it, yeah, again. And you're not adding like theology say, to that. It's, 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 it's sort of reweighing the evidence. 
So you're getting a small amount and you're saying this is pretty important because it's so crucial. Well, there are, yeah, there are crucial points. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that can go either way. Um, that maybe feel a little strong, a little easier to explain one way, but they're not, you know, uh, they're not as crucial. On carbon-14, if it's residual, there's no reasonable mathematical model that can interpret it in terms of long age. And the evidence for it being uh, residual are getting stronger all the time. And in fact, I have run into now two people who have tried to explain it and both of them admit it's there. One of them tries to explain it on the basis of getting churned into coal underground. The other one tries to explain it on the basis of neutrons. Neither one of those explanations is very good in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that leaves uh, residual activity as the unchallenged one, or, the, or the, the by far the more likely one. So that's, you know. So theolog the, the theological evidence is not necessary in your opinion for what you have done. You have taken some fairly critical pieces of scientific evidence and you've weighted them much more heavily than, than the uh, intelligent design theorists apparently do because you know they, they, they go with a long age. Um, Some of them, most of them. Most, well, I think the vast majority of them. Uh, like I say, I can give you Paul Nelson no, I can, as a counterexample. I can think of maybe one but, or two. But, but you know, uh, for example, John Sanford, who has gone full bore short age, is considered a hero of, of uh, intelligent design. Thank you. So.